Well, Ben Shapiro is here, live and uncensored. Well, that's quite an intro we've given you there. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. You that. better live up to it. I, well, I mean, I look at that old tape and it, suddenly I hit puberty, right? I mean, like this. <laughs> we both look so young. Oh, my God. Uh, I mean, that was what? That's probably over 10 that was years 10 ago. years ago. Right. That was 10 years ago. And it was interesting because I was at the time, you know, getting very uh, angry about a, a series of mass shootings in America with a British sensibility and saying, you know, we, obviously my country, we don't really have any guns. And I was, you know, hectoring and lecturing, I guess, Americans about their gun laws, and it went down as badly as that phrase would suggest, particularly with, with you. But what was interesting was, when you, when you came on, I thought, who's this snotty little kid <laughs> who's going to start trying to take me on? And then it rapidly became clear to me, you were a hell of a lot smarter than you appeared. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, we moved on from then. Anyway, we've, we've had our, our Kiss and Makeup interview after that. But I, I, I think what was pretty interesting to me, 2016, so seven years ago now, you tweeted a tweet, this is your pinned tweet to this date, simply said, facts don't care about your feelings. And if any phrase, I think, perfectly epitomises this woke era that we have somehow stumbled into, it's fact. Because the woke brigade put feelings before facts. How do we get there? Well, I mean, I'm, culturally speaking, I think that what happened is that the value of subjective authenticity became the core to pretty much everybody. So the, the idea of individualism was taken to its logical extreme, which was, I'm so important and everything I feel is so important that I can ignore the rest of reality. And in fact, reality is an imposition on me. Institutions, rules, roles, the rules of the road, all that sort of stuff, it's an imposition on who I truly am. And in order for me to be actually free, I have to speak my truth. Now, you know, as I've said and you've said, mm. there's no such thing as my truth, right. right? There's your opinion and then there's the truth. But as soon as you start speaking in terms of my truth, as soon as you start saying, well, there's how I feel about the world and how I feel about the world is the core of me, what that also does is it means that other people are aggressing on you when they disagree with you. Mm. Because obviously a shared reality means that we can disagree about things out here, but, you know, we sort of as human beings are intact. But the moment that you start to identify your truth with the truth, then anybody attacking your truth is attacking you as a human being. And I think that that's where we've gone, is, is this movement away from, we're having a political debate, but again, we can go out and have a drink afterward because we are, we are not the political debate. The political debate's a different thing. To my politics are who I am, or right. my feelings about who I am, or my feelings about the world, that's the thing that matters more than anything else. And what's extraordinary? I mean, I remember this, we're going to come to them later, sadly, but Meghan and Harry, <laughs> when they weren't on <laughs> Oprah Winfrey, and she started talking constantly about my truth and Oprah was endorsing your truth and everything. I was like, I'm living in a sort of mad world where truth is no longer factual. It's just whatever you're feeling in any given moment. It seems such a perverse thing for a democratic society that you move away from fact-based, from science, whatever it may be, to just feelings dominating a culture. And if you defy those feelings, you are instantly branded the enemy and you must be destroyed. Well, there's no conversation to be had, right? I can't have a conversation about your feelings. You're feeling your feelings. There's no way for me to dissuade you from You can't your deny my feelings. Correct. I can't deny... <laughs> I can deny the facts that you bring to the table, but the problem is once that becomes irrelevant, then we're just at an impasse. There's no more conversation to be had. How big a problem is it that at the same time, simultaneously, I think, you've had the rise of very populist leaders like Donald Trump, Boris Johnson in the UK, uh, and others who play pretty fast and loose with the truth, that you have people who say, well, hang on, you talk about the sanctity of truth, but you've got these political leaders, US presidents, British prime ministers, where they don't seem to care about the truth. They just bumble through with whatever suits them from day to day. How dangerous is that to the whole shebang? I mean, I think that that is dangerous, but it's dangerous in a different way. And, and it's also dangerous in a more consistent and, I would say, historically... Uh, precedented way. I mean, the, the fact is that politicians have always fibbed to us. I mean, there, there's nothing right. new about politicians saying things that are not true, from, from LBJ to, to George W. Bush to, to Donald Trump and Barack Obama. I mean, like, literally every politician... And Joe Biden. I mean, yeah, to, to, to President Biden. Yeah. Right? You, see, you see this all the time. So the idea of a politician not telling the truth or shading the truth in particular ways, that, that's not what's new. I think what's new is where people are presented with data and their immediate response isn't, let me bring you some data that rebuts that data, but I don't even have to look at your data because your motivation is bad. Right, this philosophy. How, and how, how dangerous is it, though, that we've also become incredibly tribal? I think more than I can ever remember in modern history, actually. You know, when I read your Twitter feed, I think you're always prepared to call out your own side if you genuinely feel there's been some egregious wrongdoing that they've done or a terrible mistake or whatever. But the number of people prepared to do that now, on social media in particular, is minuscule. Most people park themselves into their tribe 
whatever that tribe may be. And there is no moving them. There's no deviation, even if the facts change. And again, it plays into, well, if your feelings are, are the facts, then if you feel that fact is wrong, well, that's enough. Right. But the, the tribalism that I think has, has cropped up is rooted in a philosophy called emotivism, which is the idea that everybody's actual viewpoints are not driven by their view of the facts. It's, it's driven by their internal emotions. Mm -hmm. What that allows me to do on the, on the converse is attribute malicious intent to people that I'm arguing with. Mm -hmm. And it means that I get to ignore all of their facts. The reason that, that I'm disagreeing with you is because I'm good and you're a bad person. And what that means is that people on my own side, for example, they might be upset with me for talking with people on the other side of the aisle because why would you talk to somebody mm -hmm. who's a nasty person who has bad motivations? And the same thing on, on people on the other side talking to me. I, I was having a conversation one time with a very, very large left-wing podcaster. This is probably 2018. And I said, you know, we should really do like a crossover podcast for the midterm elections. It'll do huge business. And my side will be totally fine with it. It'll be great. And he said, your side will be fine with it. My side will kill me. Right. And that, that's probably But that's right. the way it's gone. And Bill Maher said to me, you know, that comedy used to be rooted really in, in right-wing extremism being comedic. And, and that was the... That was where liberal comics like him could, could get their material. Now he said it's mainly to the left. It's the woke area of politics that gives him the most comedic material. And he can't believe it. As a liberal himself, he feels just really frustrated that they don't understand how ridiculous and laughable their positions on things have become. Well, it's, it's, it's driving a bunch of people who consider themselves centre or centre-left into the arms of people who are more conservative, actually. Mm. I've made the point before that I think the future of the West may ride not on people who agree with me most of the time, you know, conservatives, traditionalists. I think the future of the rest, uh, West might, might ride on people who consider themselves kind of traditional liberals, who may agree with some of the left's prescriptions yes. economically, but who disagree with the way they want to get there, which is very often by silencing debate, using censorship, shutting things down. So the question is going to be, are they willing to put off utopia for a while in order to engage in the debate because I've the always thought, like myself, I've always thought myself not really as a political ideologue, right? I, I think I'm pretty centrist and call out everybody, really. I'm more, I see myself as a journalist, fundamentally, and don't think that being partisan helps that particular profession very much, as we've seen from those who've actually drifted down into being partisan as journalists. It doesn't work. You become an activist. Uh, but someone said the other day, you know, are you a conservative? I said, well, I've never identified as a conservative. But the, fa the farther lunatic that the left woke go, the more the pendulum swings. And eventually we all get sucked into thinking, well, OK, actually, by comparison to this, I probably am getting a bit conservative because I think they're lunatics. I, I think what's happening right now, and it's happening in a bunch of countries, is people are just craving any sense of normality. And common and, sense. And no one is providing it to them. Right. No one is providing it to them. They're taking a, a slap at the people who are responsible for the status quo as licensed to now do whatever they want. And so you're seeing the pendulum swinging wildly side to side because if you're a political leader, you're trying to harness the passions of the moment to get done the thing that you really, really want to get done, when in reality, the population just wants things to kind of just stop. Just like, I mean, leave us alone and stop. Right, I totally agree. And I think, I think that's the majority of people. Right? I mean, today, Rolling Stone uh, published a, an opinion piece on why cancel culture is good for democracy. And I read this piece, and it was so completely deluded because, of course, cancel culture is the antithesis of a democracy. It's actually the antithesis of liberalism. You can't pretend to be liberal with what that actually was intended to mean and support cancel culture. I, I, think, I think the left uses cancel culture in a very different way than most of us use cancel culture. When we talk about cancel culture, typically what we mean is you say something that they don't like on the air and they decide to secondarily boycott your advertisers or they go to your bosses right. and call for you to be fired. Right. And th that's what we mean by cancel culture. What they mean is, well, we're allowed to disapprove of you. Well, sure, you're allowed to disapprove. Turn the channel. Right? You don't have to subscribe to right. Daily Wire. You don't have to watch your show. Right? But what they do with that instead is they attempt to get you kicked off the air, not by dint of lack of ratings or something, but just because they're so angry that they're going to go yell at people and bother them until you get kicked off the air. That, that's, that's what cancel culture really is. I interviewed Congressman George Santos uh, this week, who even by the standards of was... fibbing, <laughs> fibbing politicians, I mean, it was quite startling. I'll just play the clip where he admits to being a terrible liar. I've been a terrible liar. I mean, would you be prepared to say that? Sure. Like well, I said, well, well, I've been a terrible liar on, okay. the, on those subjects. I mean, <laughs> this guy's a serving member of the United States Congress. Right? He's one of the most powerful politicians in the country by default. And he just admitted to being a terrible liar, whether that meant just volume of lies or he's very bad at them, <laughs> or in his case, uniquely, probably both. But what did you make of that? And should someone like him be allowed to stay in Congress? I mean, uh, I think that... 
the, the voters are going to decide whether he has to stay mm -hmm. in Congress or not. I, I don't have a lot of standards for who gets kicked out of Congress by members of their own party because, frankly, I think that he's almost the apotheosis of what politics has reached, which is I'm going to lie as much as I can get away with it. Mm -hmm. And then the minute I can't get away with it, I'll just be like, well, I'm, I'm sorry I lied. I mean, that's, that's really sad. As a high-profile Jewish man, I want to play the clip where he talks about being Jew-ish, <laughs> where he separates <laughs> the two parts of the word. Let's have a look at this. I would always say, I'm, I was raised Catholic, but I come from a Jewish family, so that makes me Jew-ish. If I had said it to a room with a thousand people in November, people were hysterically laughing. It was funny to them. They loved it. Now, the people have already said they were at that event, and they weren't laughing with him. There's no sign that of any evidence he has any Jewish heritage. He claimed his grandparents fled the Holocaust. There seems to be no evidence for that. His parents are both from Brazil. Um, and this idea that somehow he can be jew Ish, I not actually Jewish, just ish. Well, I mean, honestly, what he should have said is, I just on the inside, I feel Jewish. Right? If, if my, <laughs> I feel so Jewish on the inside. So I'm Jewish. I mean, what are you going to do? Challenge my feelings? Of but he being has Jewish? repeatedly said he's Jewish. Yeah. I mean, and, and not he wasn't joking. We've seen the clip, so he said it repeatedly. Yeah. No. Again, I, I sort of see him as sort of he's almost the apex predator of, of politicians <laughs> at this point. He's reached the he's reached the logical endpoint of where our politics is going. And you know, it is the job of people like you or me to, to call it out when when he says things that are not true. But I think that we've. We have reached a sort of post-truth era, not in that people don't pay attention to the truth, but I'm not even sure how many people care about the right. truth. Now, I, I do think that can be exaggerated. I do think the bulk of the population really does care very much about the truth, and that's why I think that uh, there's going to be a tidal wave of resentment that is about to crash across a bunch how of societies. How important is the truth to you? Because you've got this huge following now, massive podcast, tens of millions of people watching your stuff on social media and so on. How important is truth to you now, that everything comes out of your mouth or that you write... Is fact. I mean, it's it's the most important thing to me because I have to sleep at night. I mean, it, it, it's it's something that that I try to think about as much as humanly possible. Is is never lie to your audience, never right. say to your audience a thing that you know to be not true, and try to follow this the best data possible. And that does mean that you're very often having to be more nuanced than than sort of the politics of the situation mm -hmm. may allow. Because the easiest position in politics is always to take the the hardest right or the hardest left position, the sort of most pure, most easily understood position, or to just play the easiest game of all, which is, again, my opponent is a bad guy. My opponent is a person who hates if your we, When we had our, our dust up at CNN about gun control, for example, I'm not going to go over all that mm -hmm. again, but had I been very different with you, if I'd been very, like, respectful and said, look, I'm a British guy, these aren't my laws, I'm just as horrified as you are by these massacres, and didn't talk about gun control, which I think has always been a terribly inflammatory phrase for many Americans. They don't want to be controlled. And they certainly don't want to hear a British accent telling them about how, how they should be more controlled. But if I would phrased it as about gun safety, if that had always been the debate in America, how do you make it safer in a country that has 400 million firearms in circulation. Would that have been a more constructive debate, do you think? I think it would have been a more informative debate. And the, the reason being, I think, that clarity is, is very much opposed sometimes by, by passion. We, listen, we all get passionate about these issues. I'm, I'm not going to pretend I'm not passionate on my show or I'm completely dispassionate mm. in all circumstances. I'm obviously not. Um, but, you know, I, I think that that would have allowed for the kind of discussion where we could have looked at data from various areas of the world, where we're have regulations been effective? Where have they not been effective? What are, as I said on the show, actually, at the time, I believe, like, what are the risks and rewards of particular policies? That, that's where the good discussion area, I think, gets done. Have you, I mean, just final point on the gun thing, but it, and I'm aware many viewers who watch this in America own guns and support... Yeah, I own guns, ..the yeah. Second Amendment rights and so on. Where do you see the, the line going? As you have all these massacres and as gun ownership incre increases, there's just more guns in circulation... What do you do about that? I mean, as a, as a country as big and powerful as America, what more can be done to just make it safer? I mean, uh, again, I, the, the measures that I've always suggested are measures that tend more toward the gun owner than, than toward the, the weapon itself, mm -hmm. meaning that we obviously need better screening procedures for people who have a history of severe mental illness. We have, to, we have red flag laws on the books, but they're not enacted. I mean, people, people don't actually right. practically right. follow the red flag laws, which is why I'm kind of skeptical of the idea that if we pass some more text from the legislature, that's magically going to translate into, into better action. What we need is more alacrity from the cops. I mean, how many of these mass shootings have we seen where there are a thousand red flags mm -hmm. and the cops go to the house and then they're told, well, no, we're not, we're not going to do anything. We're going to leave you back out there. It's almost in every circumstance. So we actually do need law enforcement to have more ability and will mm -hmm. to carry out, for example, when they know somebody is severely mentally disturbed or somebody is shooting a gun at their mother, which we have we've had a case like that. 
that would be a time where you actually remove the person's guns and, and keep track of them, make sure they can't actually get guns. Right? I mean, See, if I had my way, again, when I was doing that debating, I would have had this kind of conversation. I can look back at those and realize I was letting my own emotions override. We all have these. I mean, <laughs> yeah, but it's interesting, isn't it? I, I do think an important part of how we get to a better place as, as society now, away from this tribalism, away from all this stuff, is you've got to be prepared to have this kind of conversation, which doesn't end up with me just looking at you and shouting, well, you're a complete idiot because you don't agree with me, right? Um, it's more complicated. It's more nuanced. Life is more nuanced than that. I, I like to think so. And I think that, again, those conversations can be really, really productive. I try to make a habit. I have my regular daily show, mm. but I also have a show called The Sunday Special that you've been on, yeah. in which I bring on a bunch of people who disagree, from Bill Maher to Anna Kasparian. Yeah. And we actually try to talk through these issues. And people, Last time people I came on, I people... found it a very surprisingly pleasant experience. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs>